we need to become more self-aware and we need to get to know ourselves better so that we can be more in control of our lives instead of reacting to unclear and unconscious triggers and then blaming it on our spouses. We need to start understanding ourselves better and uncovering some of our expectations. Hey, you're listening to the Blessed Couple Podcast, where we talk about how to do this marriage thing and experience God in the process. I hope you enjoy and subscribe. Let's get started. The title of the presentation is, What Were You Expecting? And the subtitle is, How What We're Expecting Affects How We Feel About What Is. So I'm just going to dive in, all right? Okay, so what I want to help us do this evening is to uncover some of our expectations, learn how they can sabotage our best efforts and figure out what we can do about them so that we can keep our sanity and strengthen our marriages. All right, that's the game plan here. So let's start right from the beginning and talk about what expectations are. Expectations are ideas that we have concepts that are based on our beliefs about the way things will or should be. Pretty simple. And the thing is that we have expectations about absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. But for the purpose of the webinar this evening, I think we should just focus on a few areas. So I want to talk about the kinds of expectations that we have concerning love and of course marriage and in particular blessed marriage because these things are important to us and we have a lot of expectations in these areas. So why can it be helpful for us to explore expectations in these areas? If I could hear your responses, I'm sure you'd have things to say why you think it might be helpful to explore, but here's the most important reason. It's important for us to explore our expectations because there is often a difference between what we're expecting and what actually occurs. And in that difference can result real disappointment and anger in a relationship, in a marriage in particular. So I want to say that again. The reason it's important for us to explore our expectations because there is often a difference between what we're expecting and what actually happens. And in that place, in that space where the difference lies, that results very often in disappointment and anger. The other problem is that because most of our expectations are unconscious, they only get revealed to us when they don't get met. So this, you can imagine, is problematic. We go into our marriages with all kinds of expectations about marriage itself and about love itself, but we don't know what our expectations are until our spouse fails to meet them. This is why it's important. So what this means is that most of the time we are reacting to things that we're not even aware of. So it's helpful if we can start to unpack some of those things that we're reacting to. (laughs) Because otherwise we will look at each other often and wonder, who is this person that I'm married to? And why is he or she so different than what I expected? So let's think for a second about where all of our expectations come from. Well, they come from a lot of places, but in particular, they come a lot from our families of origin, from our cultural and ethnic backgrounds, and of course, popular culture and media, things like TV, music, advertising, movies, magazines, and our faith practices and beliefs. All those areas have huge influences on us, and without us even being aware, contribute to us developing expectations. So let's just start with how we can develop expectations in our families of origin, because all of us came from a family, and even though most of the time we weren't conscious of what we were learning about love and marriage, we were constantly taking notes. And the biggest thing that we learned from, of course, was our parents. The way that our parents loved each other, the way that they express their love to each other and the way they express their love to us, the way that they communicated or didn't, the way they argued and resolved problems together, the way they, how much time they spent together or didn't, all of those things were teaching us about love. It was teaching us what to expect about love. 
Now, we might have had a different kind of parents. If we had parents who were adventurous and really enjoyed being together and spent a lot of time with each other, dating each other and going around with other friends, then we would learn other things about marriage and love. But the point is, by watching our parents and by growing up in our families, we learned a lot about these important topics. We also learned how to fight or how not to fight, how to agree and not agree, how to resolve conflicts, how not to resolve conflicts. And another really big thing we learned about was the differences between genders, expectations around genders, depending on how your mom whether she was a stay-at-home mom or she was a working mom, a working outside of the home mom, that would be something that you might subtly develop expectations about. Or if you had a kind of mom that was out and about and doing important things outside of the home, that would have an impact in your expectations about the role that you would play when you became a wife and a mother or that you would expect your wife to play when she became your wife. You see, we have lots of expectations based on these kinds of things that we pick up unconsciously. Of course, what we understand intimacy and sexuality to be, we also absorb from the way our parents are relating, from the way they deal with intimate and sensitive topics or don't deal with them. All of these things we're learning. And of course, on smaller levels, these are the bigger things that we're picking up by osmosis, but we also pick up smaller things that have just as much impact on us. So for example, if we grew up in a family that didn't take good care of their things, or didn't have a place for everything, or didn't feel uncomfortable in messy environments, then we would feel very comfortable in that environment ourselves most of the time. When we are growing up in our family, our family is actually telling us what is normal. That's why when we're small, you know, when we first start having play dates and visiting other people, we're shocked by how different their families are because we think that our family is the way it should be. So we often have these experiences where we go to somebody's house for the first time. I remember when I was little, going to my girlfriend's house for the first time and her house smelt differently <laughs> because she came from a different ethnic background and whatever it was that her mom was cooking, the whole house smelt differently than my house did. And it was a shock because I didn't expect that. I thought all houses smelt like wine. Do you know what I mean? Similarly, how we celebrate good experiences in our family. We learn about that in our families of origin, how we celebrate birthdays. Uh, what do we do when somebody accomplishes something well? Do we make a big deal of it or not? Do we buy presents or not? Some families have a big tradition of present giving. Other families don't celebrate much at all. So now I wanna talk about how the media affects us because it is just pervasive, it's huge, and we're not what I would say culturally literate, media literate. We're not often paying attention to the messages that we're receiving almost nonstop from the media. And yet we are picking up and forming a lot of our expectations because of the media, especially when it comes to marriage, romance, and love. A lot of what we hear in music and see on TV and in the movies offers us a very idealized, romanticized fantasy of what relationship is. It also teaches us norms that aren't normal. And some of this is in a good way, but a lot of it is in a negative way. In other words, if we were to spend an evening really noticing the messages about love and marriage that we were getting in everything we watched from, say, 7 o'clock to 11, I think many of us would be surprised because you don't see many intact families. You see, you know, sexual interactions between strangers becomes normal. Sexuality combined with violence becomes normal. Lack of responsibility in sexuality has become normal. But we're so desensitized to that, we don't even realize that we're allowing this to be going into our spirit. And it's adding to what our expectations are about marriage and family. The media also contributes to us developing expectations that are completely unattainable. Like true love means never having to say you're sorry in that old movie which of course is ridiculous because if you really love somebody, you probably have to apologize on a regular basis. It also tells us that, you know, love is easy and marriage never lasts and people look like this. <laughs> 
they never sweat when they're having sex, you know, lots of crazy things. And we're picking up all of this information without paying attention, and it's all adding to our expectations about love and marriage. Just looking at, you know, a common television show that many of my, our children of my age grew up watching, and think about what they learned about what marriage and family was supposed to be like. A big joke, basically. A lot of our young girls grew up watching Twilight, the whole series, and what were they learning about love? Were they learning realistic things or were they learning magical thinking about marriage and relationship? I think one of the biggest problem expectations that people sort of glean from the culture without being aware of it is that we go into marriage with this idea, this expectation that marriage is supposed to make us happy. Now, if we take a minute and think about that, if we go into our marriage expecting the marriage or our spouse to make us happy, what does that message and that expectation do to us? It puts all of the responsibility on our partner and takes all of it away from us. It's completely unrealistic because we think that our happiness is all dependent on another person. We have no control at all. And yet most people go into marriage with this idea. So that's why it's important for us to reflect about this. Depending on our cultural and ethnic backgrounds, we learn all kinds of things about life, but especially about love, what's expected in terms of relationship. So for example, say we come from an Asian background where respect is of the premium. It's just one of the most important characteristics of a mature person. Whereas as an Asian person, get married to a person from the Western side of the world where their companionship might be more important than respect. So you both go into your marriage with different expectations about what your relationship will be like and what it will look like. These kinds of things play out all the time in most of our marriages. A classic example would be if you grew up in an Asian family or simply a unificationist family, you might have that idea, you might expect that all families have a shoe shelf outside their house because that's the norm. You take off your shoes and you slip on a pair of slippers when you go inside. And I, I've talked to you know young people about their experience of going to someone's house for the first time who didn't have a whole slew of shoes outside the front door, you know, because that shocked them because their expectation was that everybody did that. So it could be from the big things to the smallest things, but they are constantly playing out. Again, difference in cultures is how we express our feelings or don't express them. And I'm sure pretty much everybody who's listening tonight has that experience with your either your spouse or people that you're close to. One of you might be very comfortable expressing your feelings and one of you may not. And of course, you go into your marriage expecting that your spouse will express their love in the similar way that you do. And they don't. And of course, faith has a very big part to play in terms of shaping our expectations. So for those of us who joined the movement later on in life, we were very much shaped by the faith or lack of faith that we had before we met the faith, the Unification Church, and then renegotiating all of our beliefs based on our new faith. So that's an important thing. So if we came from different faith backgrounds, then of course the way that we approach our new faith will be slightly different. And for people who are raised with a the faith, then most of our core beliefs are shaped by our faith beliefs. They're sort of blended one in the same. And I think if we look at our, many of our marriages in our movement, we can see it's pretty common thing to see a couple to use our church vernacular vertical and the other is more horizontal in their approach to their expression of faith. And unless we're really careful, that can be a problem because if we're not able to appreciate and respect each other's differences, then again, our expectations can get in the way. Our expectations can get us angry and help us to feel disappointed. So again, if we went into our blessed marriage most of us had some idea that wasn't exactly clear about what it would look like and what it would feel like and what kinds of things we would do together as couples. And of course, in many situations, in many cases, our reality, the reality that we were faced with and the reality that we contributed to creating didn't match the expectation that we went in with. 
it's pretty normal. Some people are very moved by traditions and all of the traditional aspects of faith, and other people don't find that as significant for their own spiritual growth. Usually those two people are married to each other and they require some negotiation to appreciate the differences. And in our church, of course, our favorite word is ideal. <laughs> so more than most people, we have a lot of unrealistic expectations. And I think the biggest expectations we have are with our spouses. We can forgive our friends and our children much more easily than with spouses. And that is directly connected to the expectations that we have of them. So it really, really is helpful if we can start to unpack them. So here's a couple of laws about expectations that I think are helpful. The first one is we all have them about everything, <laughs> from books to movies, from holidays to how to spend our days off. We're all the same. We all have expectations. Second law is, and this is important, the degree to which reality fails to measure up to our expectations is the degree to which we will feel disappointed. So it doesn't even matter how good our life is. Our life can be really great, but if it doesn't match up to our expectations, we will still feel discouraged and disappointed. That's how significant our expectations are and how much they can affect us. The third law is that repeated disappointments may lead to disenchantment, despair, and disgust. And as a person that's worked a lot with couples, I know that this is true. So it, it's really important for us as married people to figure out what we can do about our own expectations so that we can be more realistic and make healthier, react in a healthier way to each other instead of just reacting to unconscious expectations. So, as I said, expectations have a huge impact on our marriage. So, research shows that there's three major areas where our expectations tend to be in terms of our marriages. One is the area of boundaries. That's a really challenging aspect of most marriages. How much independence is okay? What kinds of relationship with other people are acceptable? What does it look like to be a couple? How do we express our loyalty? Where do you begin and where do you end up? And how do we figure out that kind of thing? The second area is the area of emotional and spiritual investment. In other words, how much time and effort does each person think the other one should be putting into the relationship? Now, if we just think about that for a second, we can imagine that most of us go into our marriages without a clue about how much time and effort we think we should be putting in or how much time and effort we expect our partners to put in. But as soon as it starts to happen, then immediately it doesn't match up with our unconscious expect expectations. And then the third area is the area of control and power. This is a really big area for a lot of uh, couples. The, the area of power is, like, will we share the power? And if we do, how will we do it? And who will be making which decisions? Does every get made together? Does one person have more control than the other? And you can see how cultural differences, spiritual differences, and family of origin differences would really contribute to discrepancies in how we perceive and expect control and power to play out in a marriage, right? Hey, if you're getting something good from this episode, it would mean the world to us if you could share it with someone you love or leave a five-star review because the only way this podcast spreads around is through word of mouth. So a share or a review would go a long way and it only takes like 10 seconds to do. Thanks, back to the show. So basically, from the biggest things to the little things, couples clash over all kinds of expectations. Like I mentioned, you know, from intimate issues to spending issues to how to spend the holidays, how much time with the in-laws, exercise, free time, communication, shopping, clothes, how much time apart, how to raise the children, everything comes up. And if we're not paying attention, we can spend a lot of our time feeling 
disappointed and disgruntled. So this reason I want to talk about this is to help each of us think about what we can do to begin to uncover some of our expectations. Most couples don't get go into their marriage with a game plan about who's going to be paying the bills. But you can imagine if you grew up in a family where mom did all the finances, then somewhere in the recesses of your mind, you're going to expect that your wife will do that without ever talking about it. It just becomes an expectation because that's what we saw, you know? And again, saving, spending, debt, how much debt we're comfortable with, those kinds of things very often don't get talked about until we're in the middle of marriage and freaking out because we don't have enough money and we have differences in terms of how to spend it and how to save it and how much debt we can handle. We have emotional relationships with money that stem from the way we were raised and also from our faith. So some people think money is not important. It's spiritual life that counts. And other people think, you know, money is important because it gives us a platform for which we can do good things for other people. And then there's everything in between. Again, we have to explore our expectations. Couples don't go into marriage, again, making a list. Who's going to do this? Who's going to do the grocery shopping? How are we going to celebrate holidays? We just go in expecting to do these things the way we did them in our or families of origin. How are we going to express our faith? How many kids are we going to have? How are we going to raise those kids? That's a, a, obviously an area where a lot of couples struggle because they go into the marriage and begin their parenting with so many expectations about how to do it well. So again, why is, it, why is understanding our expectations important? Because the expectations that are not met, even if we have no intention of disappointing our spouse, the expectations that are not met almost always lead to feelings of sadness, disappointment, and anger, which of course is not going to be helpful if it happens on a regular basis in your marriage. In other words, you will be disappointed or happy in life depending on how well your experiences match up to what you expected. So it makes sense for us to spend some time trying to look at our expectations. We need to become more self-aware and we need to get to know ourselves better so that we can be more in control of our lives instead of reacting to unclear and unconscious triggers and then blaming it on our spouses. We need to start understanding ourselves better and uncovering some of our expectations. So let me be a little clearer with you. There's three problems, basic problems with expectations. Okay, the first one is that most of the time we are unaware that we have them or what they are. So first piece of homework I want to give you is, and of course you're free to not take it, <laughs> but I'd like to recommend it because it can be really a helpful exercise, is to spend at least a week every time you notice yourself feeling disappointed or angry, stop and take a minute and ask yourself, what was I expecting to happen that didn't happen? What was I expecting my spouse to say or do that they didn't say or do? So whenever we get disappointed or angry, that can be a very big clue that one of our expectations was not being met. Okay, so that's the first piece of homework. And that, you know, that you could do that for 21 days. And I think if you did that, I know I've done it, you can really learn a lot about yourself and how much you, you are operating off of your expectations without being aware of it. So that's always the first step is becoming more aware. The second thing is once we start to uncover some of those expectations, then we need to ask ourselves, hey, is that expectation reasonable? Does it make sense that I have this expectation? So for example, the kind of thing I mean is like say, I used this example already. Say you grew up in a household where your mom and dad both had jobs outside of the house. So that was the norm for you. So you just expected that you would, you know, and say you're a girl. So that was what you expected. And then you got married and just without really communicating it to your partner, expected that your partner would think that was a reasonable thing. And then you started having children and everything fell apart because your spouse had a different expectation of how your family was going to deal with that. 
Okay, so is that reasonable or unreasonable? That's what you have to ask yourself. Another example would be if you're a guy and you grew up in a family where your mom stayed home and so she was able to make dinner every night and then you got married but you and your wife both worked outside of the home and yet you still expected her to make dinner every night. So you might not realize that that was happening, but if you started to notice, pay attention to your responses, you might find yourself getting disappointed at the same time every day. And then you might start to notice, gee, I think I'm disappointed because I was expecting her to make dinner. She never seems to want to make dinner. Why doesn't she want to make dinner? So in other words, oh, so I was expecting her to make dinner, even though both of us work outside of the home and we both come home late and we're both tired. So is that a reasonable or an unreasonable expectation? Do you see what I'm saying? So that's our part. That's what we can do. First, uncover them and then ask ourselves if they're reasonable. If they're unreasonable, then we should just get rid of them. They don't make sense. They don't fit in my life. A lot of times we have expectations that we put on another person, but they're really about ourselves or that we another situation but it's, it doesn't fit in that situation because it had to do with something else where it actually made sense so that's why we have to unravel that so if it's an unreasonable expectation we need to get rid of it however what happens if we find that it's a reasonable one so maybe for example your spouse has to travel a lot and you expect that they'll call you once a day to check in with you when they're traveling and you don't actually say anything, but that's what you expect. And then your spouse is very busy when they're traveling for work and they forget to do that or they just don't even think to do that. And you get more and more upset, more and more and more upset. So you have to ask yourself, first of all, why am I so upset? Ah, oh, I'm upset because I was expecting them to call, but they're not calling. Now, is that a reasonable request or not? That's what you have to ask yourself. If you find out that it's a reasonable request, the next thing to do is ask ourselves if we have shared it with our spouse. Because my experience is that a lot of times we have not such unreasonable requests and expectations, but we don't actually clearly communicate them with our spouses. So now I want you to ask yourselves, why do you think that is? Why is it so hard for us to share our expectations clearly with our spouses and I'll tell you my experience and what I think is what happens one of the problems is that we have culturally picked up that if you really really love me you'll just know what I need so somehow we equate real love with mental telepathy in other words if they really love me they will know I won't have to tell them so we can spend years waiting for our spouses to figure something out about us because we think it's a demonstration of their real love for us when actually even when you really really love somebody and know them really well we often don't know what to do and what our spouse needs so I'll give you an example of that because it's always helpful with examples one of my love languages is touch partly because I'm Italian as you could tell by the way I talk and so early on in our marriage, I really just loved walking and holding hands with my husband. And my husband is a British kind of New Zealand kind of guy, and it's not his love language. Not to say we never held hands, because we did, but I wanted it way more because it was my love language and it made me feel so happy. And I hoped and wished for years that he would get that. <laughs> and then one day I decided to take my own advice and got the courage to actually tell him that's the other reason that we don't tell our partners what we're really thinking and feeling and what our expectations are even if they're realistic because we're afraid we're afraid that our suggestion idea need will be rejected and that's unbearable it's very scary to be honest and it requires being vulnerable and it's hard to do and so we go back and forth between hoping and hoping that they'll get it on their own by osmosis and magical thinking and being afraid stuck in our fear so in my case it took me years literally years before I had the courage to actually say to my husband hey you know when we walk down the street and you take my hand I just love it it makes me really happy and of course my husband didn't really know how to respond to that because at this point we'd been married about 
20 years. <laughs> so he didn't say anything, and I thought, you know, does he think I'm crazy? I don't know what to think. But you know what happened? The next day, we were walking down the street, and sure enough, he grabbed my hand. And so it was like a double whammy because, A, he took my hand, so that made me happy because it's my love language. And B, I knew that he was doing it on purpose. On purpose because he wanted to meet my need. He wanted to meet my expectation. He wanted to make me happy. That's what love is about. So in order to get there, we have to take risks. Unfortunately, that's the catch-22 of building real love. To create the kind of marriages that we want with the level of intimacy that we all want and need requires taking risks and it requires being vulnerable. That's why we don't communicate with each other. So what can couples do to minimize their disappointment? Well, first doing the steps that I talked about where we do our portion of responsibility so that we can uncover our own expectations and decide if they're realistic or not. And then we want to be able to start a conversation with each other carefully, kindly, one by one. And then, of course, a large part of relationship is compromise. We want to throw out our unrealistic expectations and we've got to learn the difference between hoping for something or demanding something and just requesting. Big difference. We need to remember that happiness is something that I create, not that I'm just going to sit around and wait for somebody else to create for me. And we have to learn to accept each other, really accept each other, however different we are. So just to boil that down into three points, let me go over. First thing is we have to begin to notice when we feel angry or disappointed. Absolutely the most important thing. Second thing is we have to ask ourselves if that was a reasonable expectation or not. And then if it is, we want to communicate it clearly, no matter how hard it is to our spouses. If we can do those three things, then the most important thing is when our spouse makes themselves vulnerable to us with a request or an expectation, then we want to be motivated to meet that because that's what love is about. Real love is giving what our partner needs, not what we feel like giving. So it's the next level of investment and that's what we're all trying to get to. So in the game of life, we're going to be traveling together and every day, our expectations are going to invade and they always have the possibility of sabotaging our happiness, our communication, our connection with each other. So if we take responsibility and start to uncover them, then we can be more in control. We can be in the driver's seat of our lives. We have to ask ourselves, what kind of marriage do we want to create? Do we want to build a marriage that has the ability, the capacity for vulnerability and intimacy? If so, we have to take risks. And if we do this, then we can learn how to manage our expectations instead of having them manage us. So that's the end. So I hope it was a practical enough for you to feel uh, like you could work on this for yourself. And as John said at the beginning, there are two handouts besides the little bit of homework that I recommended in the talk, there's two handouts that actually are an exercise. One of them is just an overview of what I said, so it's just like a page to kind of go over the main points to remind yourselves, and the other is an exercise that you can do as a couple. So what I would recommend for that exercise is that you answer the questions individually, and then you talk about them. And they're about topics that all couples have expectations about, so you'll start to uncover and possibly understand some of your challenges. And that's my hope through the conversation that you have using the questionnaire. Hey, if you want to improve your relationship or take your sex life to the next level, well, you're in luck because more than 70% of couples that take our Love and Integrity course said that the quality of their sexual relationship improved after joining the course. Sounds good? You can join the program today with your spouse or just take the course by yourself at loveandintegrity.com. See you in the next episode.